evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Friday sessions. Um, again, thank and welcome back, um, Dr. Baltazar, for joining us. Uh, and um, though he's our expert panelist, we are open for comments from everyone. So you can chime in your comments on the chat, or you can raise questions on the chat uh, as we go out through the cases. Uh, we have 11 cases today. Uh, all of them are new cases. We don't have any follow-ups so today. And we'll start off with cases from Jaipur from Dr. Vivek. Okay, so yeah, so can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So this is a day foot forty baby who had no perinatal issues, was well till just few days before admission with us. So he had fever and then had uh, respiratory distress and within twenty four hours became drowsy and then started to have fre frequent seizures. Seizures which were uh, multifocal, so clonic convulsive seizures, uh, right or left. And then in spite of phenobarbital, phenytoin, levetiracetam didn't stop and he had to be ventilated on midas infusion. And uh, uh, in spite of that, he we, we put him on continuous EEG monitoring and in, on that also he was having electrographic and few ictal events. Um, we did give him pyridoxin as well. And that didn't help. And actually, unfortunately, family decided to take the child. So uh, to the because there were some financial issues after three days of admission with us. Uh, presently, child is admitted in the government hospital where has unfortunately developed uh, hospital acquired sepsis. And the seizures had continued there till I last spoke to them a few days back. So we did a CSF, uh, which was normal, and his uh, neurometabolic workup initial was normal as well. So it's more with this acute history, whether this is a cytotoxic injury due to an infectious process or still a neurometabolic disorder. That's why I wanted to discuss this case. Okay, so we'll go on to the MR. We have the diffusion and ADC sequences. And uh, you can straight away appreciate that there is a symmetrical nature to the abnormalities in the brain. Uh, it is a cytotoxic uh, brain edema, predominantly involving the corticospinal tracts, extending from the peridoronic regions um, going down. Extend, usually also involving the basal ganglia, but more along the capsule than the dorsal striatum or the internal structure of the deep brain nuclei. The dentate nuclei also demonstrate symmetrical changes of cytotoxic edema. On the ADC sequences, you can better appreciate the involvement around the basal ganglia. The white matter structures are more predominantly involved than the gray matter structures. And there again, the pyramidal tract involvement and dentate nuclei involvement. The T2 and the phase sequences, uh, nothing much which adds to the diffusion variant sequences. So there is some hyperintensity of the basal ganglia which corresponds to the diffusion variant sequence changes. But other than that, no structural abnormalities per se. Uh, and these are the T1 flares. Um, no focal lesions uh, or there, no hemorrhage, at least on these images, no in the deep brain nuclei, uh, no subdural or external connections, and the flow wise were intact. So no, no arterial or venous abnormalities on the plane scans. Um, the differentials that could be thought of were, the question was, is it metabolic or is it acquired? Uh, these are the differentials uh, which I could think of predominantly involving the corticospinal tracts. Uh, we don't have a spectroscopy. Glycine um, encephalopathy is possible, but dentate nuclear involvement is slightly atypical there. ITP encephalopathy, presence of microcephaly and refractory seizures. Uh, not, I'm, I'll just check with Dr. Yaku if it fits clinically or not. The other are uh, mitochondrial disorders um, can present with similar abnormalities, but given the symmetrical nature, I would think more in terms of a genetic than an acquired cause, but I'll still open the case for the panelists to comment upon. So uh, NKH and ITPA were the two things uh, thought of. We couldn't do CSF or genetic studies for this patient, but again, for NKH, the dentate involvement, I don't know whether that's seen yeah. and uh, that's uh, part of the spectrum in NKH, right? Yeah. And I yeah, thought that I was, was more, more of early onset NKH within the first few weeks, but if you present after three, four weeks, late onset as more corpus callosal dysgenesis, uh, called per kefli, right? That's how it yeah. is, is it? Yeah. Yeah, and MSUD was ruled out because TMS and uh, GCMS were normal. 
Yeah, and the brainstem is relatively spared, which is slightly atypical for the at least the early infantile neonatal presentation of MSUD. The subthalamic nuclei yeah. also over. Yeah, the few ITP patients I had, they had, you know, they don't have this acute regression within few days. Mm. Uh, the mm. patients we did have had few seizures, uh, multifocal, but they do mm. deteriorate in a febrile illness, which we had in our few patients where you had uh, onset of illness few weeks back with some seizures. And if you have a febrile illness, the seizures increase. But this child started with this three days history of, uh, you know, but, um, fever. Yeah, yeah, fever and then deteriorated. And it doesn't look like a, there was no hypoxic event, I, I guess. Uh, no, no, the, no hypoxic. The change, yeah, the changes don't look like a hypoxic injury, typical hypoxic mm -hmm. injury. Um, My uh, experience with NKH is limited, but I have seen a few cases in Armenia. And uh, the onset was in the first week of life. Of course, I know there is a spectrum, but they were kind of collapsing on the two or three and needed to be ventilated. And if I remember correctly, they had brainstem involvement, which I don't see in this case. And it's quite pronounced involvement of a dentate nucleus, probably not specific, but would that help in, in a differential diagnostic decision? Would you yeah. think of mitochondrial layer division or? You got it given the dentate or? I wonder whether this is infectious in the broad sense. Okay. So some form of viral illness which caused, uh, you know, cytotoxic edema, like inter, uh, you know, interfer interleukins, strom, something that's all. As it happens in A&E, it's not A&E, but uh, yeah, same sort of spectrum. Not yeah, the only thing was, it was very symmetrical, but I mean, symmetry still again uh, can be overstated. Because one wonders with age, you know, with myelination, maybe the injuries are different. If you have an injury in the first few months, it presents like this. Maybe it presents mm -hmm. later with any, you know, you, you never know if the uh, immaturity of brain myelination causes a different pattern of injury in any form of uh, interleukins uh, in this storm. That's one thing. But nothing on the CSF was, was a PCR done, not really? Uh, PCR uh, was not done. CSF uh, routine was done only, and the protein was also not raised, and they were less than five cells. I may have missed the point. Did you do an EEG? Yeah, he had a continuous EEG monitoring for a few days, and he had frequent uh, electroclinical and electrographic seizures which were refractory to treatment. So we had to achieve bus suppression using high-dose midas to stop them. Thanks. But baseline EG did not show bus suppression to suggest a epileptic encephalopathy. But I would say ITPA is still a possibility because the two patients we had before, uh, they did have seizures, but they really worsened refractory epilepsy in a febrile illness in ITPA. Yeah. yeah. So that is definitely a possibility. All right. Uh, okay. We'll keep those as the possibilities if there are no further comments. Uh, any question? Could it be, be fires? Could it be fires? Uh, yeah. In broad sense, yes. If I, you know, I had never seen fires in a 40 day old baby. Yeah. Most of the Same. patients have presented after two years' age and maybe one between six to 12, but one can never say no to anything, you know. Uh, is yeah, it but the age and onset makes yeah. any immune mediated condition very unlikely. You know, it's, mm. we don't really see any immune mediated condition. In this case, we don't even see, I mean, I think even if you look at antibody mediated conditions, you know, the earliest we see is like, the, the, the child needs to develop its immune system. So it wouldn't make sense that, uh, that this, I mean, I think it's much less likely to be acquired, acquired purely by the age of the child. Acquired, immune acquired, not. Uh... Uh, 
Yeah, you mean this is a acquired immune disease? You meant it is not. No, I'm saying no, it's not is, because how old the yeah. age goes against it. The child doesn't even have a you know maturing immune system enough to to cause this. Yeah. Yeah, so definitely not fires that we don't even know what's caused fire. But I'm just saying in general, I think the likelihood of this being acquired is is very unlikely. And if this is acquired from the mother, you would expect the symptoms to happen at birth when the antibodies are the highest. And if it's from the child, you wouldn't expect. I don't think there's any autoimmune diseases that we see, you know, before six months of age. Yeah. In general, not just neurological, no. I mean, I, I'm kind of throwing it as a general comment. So it would yeah. make no sense to me to have, particularly that, you know, the picture is, is if anything, mimicking so much metabolic, I think this is much less, I mean, this, you know, I, I think it's atypical to be acquired and the age makes yeah. it nearly impossible. Yeah. 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 Right. Thanks, Ian. Um, question, um, six months at least to get autoimmune reaction by Maria. Yeah, because this is like, for example, why we don't even vaccinate at that age group because you don't 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 create a response. So we actually have, you know, some data on those things. So I think, um, you know, this is way too early. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you. We do have his DNA stored, so we extracted and stored it. So maybe mm -hmm. uh, we'll see if I can convince family later to do some. Yeah. Got it. All right. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, the next patient, she's a 13-year-old girl who six weeks back, uh, she before that there were no issues at all. And she had a few days history of high fever, fatigue, loss of appetite. And then she had a, a left eye swelling with acral rash. Uh, Nihal, did you get the photographs? I got the video. Uh, I have the video. Photographs, so, okay. I Okay, so she had a she had a acral rash on hands and feet, feet uh, non blanching rash uh, uh, with left eye swelling, and at the time, uh, this is later. So okay. we'll go back to the history. So okay. and then at the time she uh, with no organomegaly, but she had uh, ten cytopenia. She had low platelets of forty thousand. She had a, a hemoglobin of eight and low neutrophils and hence she was uh, we also did a ferritin which was 3500 with the liver dysfunction otpt deranged 200 220 so uh, and we did a ebv which was vc igm was positive so the postulation was she had a ebv infection which triggered a secondary hlh and she was given low dose iv dex followed by oral steroid she went home and within five six days she came back because she had one few episodes of right oromotor clonic seizure. And in between the seizure, she was not encephalopathic, but uh, was uh, unsteady, not talking properly, uh, amnesic, and uh, at times talking irrelevant as well. So, and then she was admitted with us again after uh, you know five few days at home and then came back and readmitted for this neurological presentation. And this time her ferritin were actually coming down to 700. It had come down to OTPT was improving. So that part was improving. His accounts were now near normal. But uh, we did a MRI and Nihal will show you the MRI later. And uh, for, following that, we started on methyl pred pulse. And within few, uh, two, three days after giving the pulse and as her sensorium improved, she looked very, uh, so she had a very, uh, uh, she had a decreased facial expression. She was a bit catatonic. Um, if you ask her to raise her arm and bring it down, she won't. She'll bring it down very slowly. Then she'll talk. She will just mutter. Um, uh, unfortunately, the voice is not there. But if you ask what your name, what your name is, so it's very. So she was very dysphonic, dysarthric. Sorry, dysphonic, and she also had a degree of dysphagia. So, so she, this neurological presentation was there and uh, with catatonia, dysphonia, dysphagia, and then you will see the MRI which shows the lesion in the medulla. So we were not sure if this all is part of the autoimmune process or the structural lesion which has happened in the medulla. And she's still very sleepy. So for the catatonic process, we gave her an IV lorazepam test of 2 mg IV, which uh, didn't make her better. 
So, so we have been. She has gone home few days back. So we sent her home on oral steroids. So we had still been confused whether we go to the next stage of doing a plex and IVI or IVIG or just let the things get better. But she's definitely better than what she was when she got admitted the second time. So when she was drowsy, she's better now. So she's improving, but slowly. Can I ask Hello. you a question? Before yeah, yeah, you, yeah. You, does she have any peripheral involvement? Because you know, with all these HLHs, you can also get like a peripheral nerve involvement. Do you think it's a dual uh, PNS and PNS? Okay, so she had hyperreflexia. She had hyperreflexia, and uh, she, we didn't do a NCV for her because it was more of a. Uh, there was no peripheral involvement in her, so there was no. Uh, but she you didn't don't need this. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No and and, and the reason we're saying that it's secondary to EBV, I mean, you can still have primary HLH, secondary so to EBV. EBV was, the, so she did not have perforin deficiency. We did that test. Just for the perforin gene or for all the genes? We just did because that was quick to get. So you can get it because genetic study has not been sent. That will take few weeks. But perforin was okay. not there. Deficiency was not there. It, because particularly when it's in the context of EBV with the CNS ones, we've, we, we're seeing actually quite a lot of those isolated CNS, HLH, and EBV is, is, is like makes you suspicious that this is one of the genetic um, HLH okay. in particular. Sure. So we can do a exome uh, in follow up, but our confusion on the MRI changes was is this HLH? It didn't look like, mm, or is yeah. it? A secondary autoimmune process so, and reaction to the ABV infection. So that was the confusion with the MRI changes. Because they didn't look like HLH. All right. Um, I think Dr. Abhishek, your background voice is coming. If you can just move your phone. Okay. So the MR findings. Um, this is into which day of illness, Dr. Babi? Any idea? Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Now you okay, are. Yeah. yeah. So which, uh, how, how long into the presentation was the MRI done? So it was... Uh... 10 days into the illness and two, three days okay. after the CNS presentation. Okay. So there is some uh, degree of volume loss in the cerebral hemispheres on both sides. And you can appreciate there is a T2 hyperintensities or idiomatous changes along the periventricular regions, um, the undersurface of the corpus callosum, the pericellular regions, the insular cortex, the bilateral dorsal striatum over there, and again, going down inferiorly, involving the basic frontal lobes, the amygdala and the mesial temporal lobes. The limbic system is involved, the dorsal striatum is involved, the insular cortex is involved, and some areas of the periventricular white matter is involved. Uh, some hyperintensities along the dorsal, the dorsal aspect of the lower pons, but the primary finding were of concern was the edematous changes involving the medulla. On the diffusion weighted sequences, the these tiny foci in the bilateral frontal lobes involving the deep and superficial white matter demonstrated some areas of diffusion, whereas the changes in the the basal ganglia not demonstrated here, but uh, and the temporal lobes did not demonstrate any restricted diffusion. The abnormality on the player of the medulla again did not demonstrate any areas of restricted diffusion. No hemorrhagic or calcific foci on the gradient uh, sequences in the supra or impotent of the brain. The slightly images again can appreciate the, the cerebral and some degree of vermis atrophy. The abnormality involving the medulla, predominantly the ventral aspect of the medulla over there. And contrast sequences were done. I could not appreciate any abnormal contrast enhancement in the supra or infertile brain parenchyma. The cervical cord screening was done. And again, on the cervical thyroid images, I cannot appreciate any focal lesions, nothing on these axial sequences. And again, the medulla, the lesion in the medulla did not demonstrate any enhancement. NMO, MOG, uh, NMDA were negative. Yeah, given that uh, EB was positive, uh, they can present with the abnormalities involving the dorsal striatum and the extra cap the capsular regions. So viral encephalitis only on imaging could be a possibility. Uh, autoimmune process, given the 
the, the sequence of clinical presentation again, um, at least on imaging, the, the areas involving the dorsal striatum and the limbic system could be, have been a differential on imaging. Um, yeah, these are the typical examples for the autoimmune processes. And HLH, um, though the typical pattern is the diffuse involvement, uh, multifocal gray and white matter involvement, uh, cerebellar involvement, and these punctate or nodular um, foci of enhancement on the post contrast study. Initially, they can present as patchy lesions in the involving the deep gray, the white, white and the gray matter structures and can later on progress to have significant cerebral atrophy, subdural collections, and also can have thyrotoxic injury in the brain. So, imaging these were the differentials, and um, yeah, I'll open the case for the panels. So, there were something which was odd that the lesion were not restricting um, the diffusion. So, that's why we thought the direct viral injury or hemophagohistiocytosis was less likely. Is that how one can think that way? And it's more inflammatory. Yeah, but because EBV, want, yeah. will it not yeah. cause? So, if you have a lesion on T2, then you should also have on diffusion some degree yeah, of restriction. Hence, I asked the time frame. Uh, when was the scan done? Was it in acute period or was it in the sub acute? Acute, sub acute, uh, like within two days of the acute CNS involvement. Yeah. Two days. Okay, two days. Yeah, then we'll expect. Yeah, but two days. Uh, what? Uh, it may be often. actually because sometimes you actually the, the change over time helps you kind of yeah. see patterns. Do you know if the EBV was also positive in the P in the CSF in the PCR? So it was negative in the CSF, but in the blood there were uh, one thousand four hundred copies in the blood, not in the CSF. And HSV was negative as well. We just did that as also just so which which EBV. makes it. All it makes it all immune versus and how many cells did she have although the, the the protein was a bit high so she just has two cells less than five two or three less than five it says no yeah. cells but i think two cells there were no cells literally and there was nothing systemic crp and everything was uh so she had a high crp of 56 initially in the initial presentation but uh, in the CNS presentation, it had normalized. Hmm. So our confusion still was that should we, so she's getting better, but not normal, whether one should flex her or give her IVIG now, uh, or just wait for the process to settle down. And there is no enhancement on the scan or was the conscious not given? No, there's no enhancement. Okay. Normally, the, the patients that respond to Plex best are, are the one with enhancement. And and do you think, I mean, she has a bit of ptosis and does she have ophthalmoplegia? Do we think it's all lesion or this is what I was asking you earlier, if it's not like a bit of an overlap with the bicus plus and uh, do we think this is all from the lesion causing her these uh, brainstem symptoms? I didn't get you. Are you asking me that uh, the Can critical findings? Yeah. The fact that she's not smiling and she has ptosis and she's not moving yeah. her eyes? Or? Yeah, so that was uh, hey, hey, definitely a possibility. Is it because staph encephalitis? Because as you rightly saw, that she appeared to have mild ptosis yeah. uh, with us. and But there was no ophthalmoparesis, but definitely there was mild ptosis. And both uh, pupils are normally reacting. Reflexes were easily elastable, but yes, she had bilateral ptosis, mild ptosis, which people were attributing to drowsiness, but it was more than drowsiness. And facial expression were less, so maybe some facial weakness. Yeah. And her bands? So we didn't do CSF oligoclonal bands. We didn't do that. Okay. okay. We need to develop that habit. So I do think just... that if it's easy for you guys to um, to do, you know, I'm just thinking that actually, you know, peripheral neurophysiology may help because if you have an overlapping, you know, syndrome, then you may go for IVIG and explore that, not urgently because the treatment, you know, explore that that option of, of um, genetic HLH. And I think if, if, you know, you don't have, and this is all central and she was commenced on steroids, I mean, it's it's a bit hard to argue for Plex at the moment when there's no enhancement and there's nothing systemically, so you know. So then maybe you just do a more prolonged steroid course. I think yeah. you know my feeling is with these patients is that you normally um, don't find an antibody or anything for them, so you don't necessarily chase the 
the diagnosis, but you just manage them. And with the MRI, I have noticed that sometimes with these patients, the MRI is quite dynamic. So, you know, if you repeat it a couple of weeks after, it may give you some clues towards which way things are going. Yeah, sure. Even but though we I thought of, yeah, the first stuff, but those basal ganglia lesions were odd. That was something which was odd for it. Because stuff yeah. that was something we... but sometimes you see those and we've seen a few i don't know if this year has been particularly bad for all of these but we've seen all oh, last year we've seen a few with kind of those overlapping you know atypical okay. so that's why actually if you can do neurophysiology and you're seeing any of it also of the limbs sometimes you get because they have central lesion and of superimposed peripheral then you still have brief replaces with an underlying neuropathy okay there's because it, it just it just helps you because most antibody mediated diseases don't give you CNS and PNS, so it just push you towards different pathobiological mechanism. Yeah, because she does have albuminocytological dissociation in a way, eighty nine of yeah. protein and cells. That it will so be easy to do but, that. In neurophysiology won't be difficult. So. Yeah, so that would you know if she does have a, you know GBS Miller Fisher type, that would explain the way it's a protein. Otherwise, it's a bit weird. Yeah. Even though the Miller Fisher I have seen, they tend to lose their reflexes, even if they are not there. She has never yeah. lost her reflexes. <laughs> the overlapping CNS. Yeah, overlap, overlap. They have a central. She has a brainstem lesion that is causing her hyperreflexia. Right. So uh, there was something you mentioned, Yale. Uh, so in in your thought process, you tend to plex somebody if there are is contrast enhancement. Otherwise, you give IV. Can you uh, sort of elaborate yeah. on that? Because of the, I mean, most of the studies that we have is actually from, you know, adult MS patients that show that, uh, you know, enhancing lesions because it's coming from the systemic uh, tend to respond more lightly to, um, to, to plasma exchange uh, mm -hmm. in a way that if you have inflammation in the brain and you see enhancement, you presume the blood barrier is more open and things are coming from the periphery. So I kind of use it as a bit of a marker if I see a lot of enhancement, even, you know, in MS or even in you know, demyelination and, you know, the others, I, I find the plex works a bit better. Um, yeah. It may also be that if they're still contrast enhancing it, you're more in the acute phase. I don't know if it's, this is just a, a, a hint that I use. I know a few other people are using it also that if, you know, if it's heavy enhancing, then it's an indication that plex may work better. Um, so you do that for MOG as well, is that? Because in MOG, you don't see that. General concept for neuroinflammation. If I see a lot of enhancements, I think right. plex is to work yeah just okay. just by the biology that the conscious goes in right um and that's right. based on very old studies in ms but you know at least if you talk to many adult neurologists they kind of use this as a as a as a as a decision whether it would work or not uh where it's in condition that you know the blood brain barrier is totally closed and you know the even if you're plexing you're not doing that much right uh, but, but, and then, you know, for these type of cases, sometimes actually giving something, you know, if you really feel, I don't think it's indicated in this case because you actually still, but if you feel that there's still active disease without enhancement in a case like this that didn't respond to steroids or IVAD, I may even consider giving a course of rituximab to block the antibody production. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Versus plex. So if the plex, you're just plexing the peripherally and there's not much, uh, you know, effect on the CNS. Then, then, uh, then I don't do that. Right. Thanks. But I, I it's not. It's more of a, a practice than a scientific. So, so, if if people feel differently, I mean, please, it'd be interesting to know. So. Anyone else wants to yeah comment on the treatment plan so approach? Any was negative. Uh, yeah. Any was negative. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't think we have any further comments. So thanks, Dale. And again, we'll probably uh, look for a follow up, Dr. Vivek, if the yeah. patient is responding. Right. Right. Thanks. So <clears throat> there's another uh, six month old baby who suddenly, so age is different, but the history is sort of similar. Uh, so six month old baby who was well, normal development and suddenly acute onset, your uh, upper respiratory tract infection with fever, mild fever, 
and uh, just was slept well in the night and 3 am woke up in tonic posturing and uh, became encephalopathic was intermittently posturing in the local hospital thought to be seizures and was uh, not improving with anti epileptics so was transferred to us uh, on admission with us we started him on continuous eeg monitoring for 24 hours at the time these posturings were not seizures they were not uh, events they were just dystonic posturings uh, we did a MRI on day two of admission. So there are two MRIs in this patient, and that MRI I felt, even though it was reported normal, had a right uh, occipital white matter diffusion restriction, uh, and uh, the child was given methylpred and IVIG, just assuming that this is some sort of autoimmune process, uh, and as the posturing stopped, fever stopped, and as the child came out of the illness after three four days. Uh, he was intermittently still dystonic, irritable, and there was no visual fixation. Pupils were normally reacting. There was no persistent gaze, but he just was not fixing, literally blind. So he was not looking at you. And irritable, regressed, no recognition of family. Uh, we did a CSF, uh, uh, an MDA on this child, which was negative. And uh, we did ammonia, which was mildly raised, but his TMS and urine GCMS were normal and he had a normal lactate. So he went home after five, six days of treatment and anti-dystonia treatment was started, diazepam tablet, pesitane. And uh, after seven days, he came back in follow-up. So 10th day of illness, and he still continued to be uh, irritable, no visual fixation, posturing. So we repeated the MRI just to see if we had done it too early in the first time. So Nehal, maybe we could look at the two MRIs. Yeah, so this is the first MR. Uh, uh, I could not, you know, I could not appreciate the occipital uh, change. The, the left side diffusion mind. restriction, okay, okay. So at least uh, to me, it looks like there is no restricted diffusion over there. The ADC did not demonstrate any uh, low signal changes. So I don't have the ADCs because I thought the diffusion were normal enough. Uh, there is some widening of the subarachnoid spaces, but that can be benign at this stage. Um, other than that, again, possibly slightly. What was the age? Six months, right, Doctor? Six months. Yeah, maybe the vestibular angle is slightly hyperdense because I'm unable to differentiate that from the adjacent white matter. Usually, they're slightly more darker than the capsule. Uh, so maybe the dorsal striatum basis the angle is slightly hyper intense. Um, yeah, but other than that, I cannot appreciate any um, abnormalities over there. And there's no history of hypoxia. Yeah, no, that wouldn't fit with hypoxia. Um, yeah, yeah, but they're slightly hyper intense. They're normal for age because your arm the with the gray white matter is not it's not really distinctive at this stage. So at six months, it should be possible. Uh, no hemorrhage or calcification or mineralization on the SWA sequences. Um, the corpus callosum normal thickness for six months old, uh, normal volumes of the brain stem and the cerebellum. So initial scan, um, other than the subtle changes of the basic and the hypertensies, I wouldn't have thought of anything else uh, for an abnormal finding. And this is uh, two weeks later, and you can appreciate there, there's significant interval uh, reduction in the cerebral and cerebellar volume, predominantly in the vermis. But you have these white matter changes um, involving the deep subcortical regions, the periventricular white matter have Frontoparietal regions have uh, these hyperintense changes, which are not seen on the initial scan. And the dorsal striatum have these uh, partially confluent patchy hyperintensities um, involving the bilateral dorsal striatum left more than right. Uh, Talama are relatively spared, I think so. But yeah, so there is interval cerebral and vermin atrophy with these uh, white matter changes and these basal ganglia changes. On the diffusion, uh, you had a uh, Focal area in the spinium of the corpus callosum. Was the child teasing uh, up to it? No, he's, no, uh, no seizures. Okay, okay. So that's a cytotoxic lesion of the corpus, corpus callosum over there. But other than that, I cannot appreciate any um, restricted diffusion in the rest of the brain. Um, no mineralization, no hemorrhage or mineralization again over there. T1 corresponding high point densities um, suggested of the adiomatous changes you have seen on the T2 it is sequences. And post contrast, there was no enhancement of the abnormal areas in the ganglia. So, thinking of infection, uh, given that the first scan was normal, as one of the possibilities, uh, the, the lesion of the corpus callosum can, as we all know, is a suggestor of a mild encephalitis uh, type of reversible spinal lesion. Infection is one of the common causes. 
uh, seizures and malnutrition and toxic causes can have uh, these similar findings. Uh, not sure if the child is too early for uh, immune-mediated demyelination. Again, possibility of MOG or ADM uh, on imaging, but maybe six months might be too early. I'll probably leave it for Yale to comment upon that. And uh, those were the differential thought of. Um, the question was, is it a neurometabolic disorder? Given the initial scan was normal, they can still present later on. Um, the only thing that they, they usually have these areas of restricted diffusion on the DWS sequences, the, in particular the organic acidurias and the mitochondrial disorders. Even the biotin thymine in the initial stages have uh, some areas of abnormality on the diffusion rate scans, so it was not seen in our case. So, I did um, start after the second scan on biotin and thymine. Um, yeah, his uh, yeah. TMS and urine GCMS were normal, whether because glutaric aciduria can present like this. He had a he has a larger shed, uh, mm -hmm. unless it is a low excreting glutaric aciduria, which doesn't come up on DC TMS and GCMS. Uh, so in between two scans, Sylvan fissures are normal. So. Yeah, between two scans, the child was on steroids or immunotherapy or something like yeah, that. Yeah, steroid, oral steroids. Yeah, steroids. So that's causing yeah. the atrophy. So that, yeah, that's causing the atrophy. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I'll open the case for the panelists. And I have not, not done MOG, so I don't know whether that's. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm, I may have missed it because my, my phone uh, got cut off. Um, how quick was the symptom onset? Like, uh, within 24 hours of. And prior of to diet. that, was totally developmentally normal. Normal. Three days before the illness, they showed me a video of child smiling, you know, like a normal child. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 23rd Jan, he was normal. 26th, he had this. I remember the dates also. This was so dramatic. Yeah. And now he doesn't I mean, have he a doesn't, It's a bit symmetrical for Mog. Uh, I agree yeah. the biotinidase can sometimes mimic, uh, but normally with the biotinidase one, they may have like a bit of a raised lacte on the CSF. No, it's not as much the biotinidase, it's more the acute striatal necrosis responding to biotin and thymine because TMS oh, and okay. GCMS were normal. So biotinidase, oh, that okay. should see yeah. 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 And, and you, you did the neopterin, it's not like a, an AGS. So we've not done that. Uh, EGS is one possibility. So we haven't done any options on CSF. Because there is this... But then, but then you would explain, normally these one have microcephaly and you're saying that this one has macrocephaly? Is that where yeah, the... Larger. Yeah, so Slightly that would go... Larger share. Even though I do have a AGS, ADA, R1, which presented like this acutely and had a normal head and just in a febrile illness down and the... the Putaman had the swelling and later it atrophied. So not necessarily AGS will have small head, especially the ones who acutely become unwell, like a glutaric aciduria-like phenomenology and turns out to have AGS. Uh, Vivek, is the question about normal MRI initially? Is that the confusion? So the confusion is about the etiology of normal or near normal first MRI and within okay. few days you have these lesions after five, seven days. But that was probably because the first MRI, maybe the illness was evolving. So yeah. we did it too early. So now on this MRI, what should be the differential? I think all the, all the conditions that uh, Nihal listed out, uh, post-infectious ones, metabolic, nutritional. I think all those can present with similar uh, imaging findings. I will check the biotin timing levels, Dr. Very talks. So biotin levels you don't check. So okay. uh, biotin days deficiency only you do. Thiamine levels we have not. I looked at the paper uh, Ramesh and team have published recently to look if the MRI changes were similar. Uh, I'm giving him thiamine. I didn't do a level of thiamine. Yeah. But I started it just after this MRI. If you have not supplemented mother, maybe you can check mother's thiamine levels also. If she's not on thiamine, okay. normal levels. So in your patients, is that one of the MRI, you know, picture of thiamine yes. deficiency? Yes. Yes, yes, very much. Right. Usually, the initially, many of these children, they present with 
uh, something like spasms, which may be due to uh, PAH also. Mm -hmm. Spasm, yeah, did you say infantile, infantile spasm or dystonic no, spasm? No, 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 just dystonic posturing, episodic dystonic, dystonic posturing, which may be treated as seizures. Uh, we also have right, right, we also have right heart failure, I think, most of our right. cases. Okay. And he, three days before the illness, he was completely normal. It happened within 24 hours. Uh, you, 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 you said that they will have sort of a grumbling illness of few weeks, like dystonic spasms, and then suddenly they will go down. Is that no, right? No. no, no. It is generally very acute to hyperacute. Only. Acute, hyperacute, yes, like this. Yes. yes, 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 very much. Because what all he had was dystonic spasms. There were no seizures. So, And actually, the dystonic spasm is not something yeah. that we tend to see in ADEM or in, in NMD encephalitis or in any of these acquired uh, thing. D2 antibodies, I mean, to be honest, uh, beyond the original uh, publication, nobody's managed to replicate it. So, you know, it's not an entity I've seen a single patient with, so it's hard for me to comment, but I don't think uh, many would. And the age, again, is, is, is very unusual. So I think you kind of left with a you know, with an acute decompensation. So maybe the, uh, you know, mitochondrial or, or the AGS can look like this, but otherwise it's it's kind of like a metabolic condition, isn't it? So Shitij mentioned viral e ENC, is that ANAC? Encephalitis, I guess. Encephalitis. Viral encephalitis. RAN-BP2, I mean, I mean, it could be RAN-BP2, but it doesn't look like RAN-BP2. No. But the timing and, and impact could be in that spectrum. It doesn't look like RAN BP2 on the scan. No, no it no, doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, not, not in the NX spectrum. This is this is yeah. global viral encephalitis. The uh, atrophy to an extent could be explained by steroids, but there is a lot going on frontal and temporally as well. Um, you should keep the viral etiology in mind as well. Even I if there were no cells, Kish? Yep. Okay. We have been in that situation before though, right? Um, yeah, yeah, but it always, you know, I'm never quite sure what's causing what. And 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 Kish, the other thing I like, I've just saw you joining, is um, is whether this is kind of a um, an other one, like one of the AGSs. But what would go against it is that if anything, he's a bit macrocephalic and not micro. But I don't know if with the other one because they're so acute, you know, you may not see the progressive macrocephaly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Vivek, you have excluded glutaric aciduria. You said right. Yeah, by TMS and GCMS, but not yeah. by, because we can have these low secreting ones. Is that right? If people could add, so you might not pick them on TMS and GCMS. You have to do the genetics. Because uh, uh, if, yeah, I think the whole idea of under opercularization is a bit of an over deal. I think it actually is an atrophy of the frontotemporal region and glutaric aciduria, and the acute presentation is with these deep gray changes. Mm -hmm. uh, in the context of microsurf, you have to exclude that. Um, because that's something treatable to an extent in future. That's something which is in my mind. So, yeah. and you know about the viral process, would it not lead to a degree of diffusion restriction in the pitamen region? Is that not obvious? necessarily not necessarily? Viruses actually rarely cause a lot of uh, restricted diffusion or even reduced diffusivity. They are unusual. Uh, but yeah, that head looks big, even on that sagittal. Is this the initial scan? So this is anything. Yeah, it's hard for radiologists to say whether how much is steroid induced, but that has really atrophied away in, in the short interval. But that's even one day of steroids. That's three days into the illness. How much steroids did he get? One dose of steroids to cause this? It's um no, that's too much to cause. That's too much to cause. Um uh, and really then if you're talking about rapid uh, yeah, rapid neurodegeneration. I, I still think a GA1 would be there. And I, I never exclude viral encephalitis in these patterns and age groups. Uh, there's a comment from Dr. Amish that TMS, GCMS really pick up GA1 during the crisis. Oh. There's another comment of alpha anity deficiency. So that was something which was mentioned by the radiologist, L-carnitin deficiency. So immediately we started carnitine, but TMS is very good to pick up carnitine deficiency. It was normal. Uh, 
Are, are you going to do a genetic test now? Yeah. 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 All right. This that doesn't open. Can be contact on that. Okay, to our next case again, Dr. Vivek. So this uh, ten day old is just the it's more to show the extent of lesion by infection and the unilaterality. That's why this case. So it's a baby who was normal at birth within, but within few days had respiratory dis no day one had respiratory distress admitted to the local NICU for three days had IV line inserted fluids and some oxygen support went home. And within two days came back sleepy, decreased oral intake, right focal seizures and fever. And uh, the seizures were very frequent. So within 24 hours was shifted to us. And overnight we did a CT which showed uh, left hemispheric swelling. So you're not sure why that is there. Um, uh, but he was not stable enough to get an MRI done. Um, and uh, again, his EEG monitoring showed frequent left focal seizure with burst suppression on the left side, while the right side was better, the hemispheric waveforms. He did a CSF, which was suggestive of meningitis with a high CRP. So the postulation was there was some sort of an infectious process which is causing cerebritis in the whole of left hemisphere. And after four or five days of stabilizing him, we did an MRI brain with contrast. His blood culture had grown enterococcus. Uh, I was you. Yeah. Okay, so MR, you can appreciate the extensive abnormality predominantly involving the left cerebral hemisphere. There's a typical fan-shaped appearance of the E2 weighted sequences uh, involving the medullary veins. Um, the cortex also is slightly hypo-intense on the T2 weighted scan. Uh, diffuse edematous changes, mass effect on the ipsilateral deep gray nuclei causing suppression on Asia and midline shift towards the right, um, going from the frontal up to the occipital region. Again, these are interspersed areas of T2 hypointensity suggest to of some injury to the medullary veins over there. On the diffusion weighted scans, you have this uh, diffuse ischemic changes involving the cortex, the periventricular white matter, deep white matter, um, and also the adjacent uh, contralateral cortex in the right occipital and temporal region has these ischemic changes. The brainstem, uh, the ventral aspect on the left side demonstrated these areas as toxic edema. And the predominant findings are on the SMPA sequences. We have these uh, areas of blooming extensively involving the left cerebral hemispheres, predominantly along the periventricular and deep white matter, but also involving the cortex. And on the post contrast study, there is an epimental and some areas of activation enhancement or there. Um, so, this meningitis, as was demonstrated on the CSF. Um, so, given this imaging pattern in the near age group, the gram negative bacteria most commonly uh, demonstrate this imaging pattern of large um, abscess in, in, in evolution, or uh, they usually form abscesses uh, over time. Uh, they're usually anti predominant, can be multiple, and they have a multiple vein predilection, and most of them are gram negative bacteria. Um, and the medullary vein uh, thrombosis or the injury, um, as demonstrated in the example over here, is pretty similar to our case. Um, some have described it as an iris flower type pattern uh, radiating outside. But as you can see, yeah, the imaging findings are pretty similar to the one on top over there uh, on the right. And this is from Rainbow itself, uh, which has bilateral changes. And as Dr. Yaka mentioned, uh, the biculture has uh, come out to be enterobacter. Yeah, if anyone has any experiences or uh, comments on these cases, welcome to. So the whole of the left hemisphere is an abscess, right? Is that whole, all is a left abscess or you know the left side? In all of the, the cap. Uh, not yet. The capsule hasn't formed yet, uh, but I think it will eventually form into something. I think because before you get an abscess, you'll probably get leukomalacia out there, isn't it? This is yeah. all cerebritis as well at the same yeah. time. Which is causing the pressure on the because the odd thing was this was causing midline shifts. So it's the edema and the necrosis which is causing it, right? Yes. Because, right. And the medullary vein thrombus is because of the uh, some sort of uh, hypercoagulable state. In that area. No, just direct infection. Direct like, infection. Direct no. infection. And it's very unilateral, you know, it's so odd. Hematogenous, like just left side. That was all. The infection was on the left, uh, so yeah, I would have because the cerebritis is not that much on the right side. So, 
Yeah, it, the, the leptomeninges are probably involved in the brainstem yeah. as well, isn't it, from that last picture? So it's a question of time that this would disseminate across. Okay. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, all right, shifting to Hyderabad, uh, Dr. Pawan, if you're there. Nice. Uh, this is a 12 year old male child. Uh, born to non consanguineous marriage with uh, presented with acute febrile <coughs> acute febrile encephalopathy with refractory seizures and uh, on presentation there was uh, high anion gap metabolic acidosis hypoglycemia recurrent hypoglycemia with uh, lactic acidosis and uh, we suspected uh, as first possibility as uh, metabolic possible organic acidemia or fatty acid oxidation defect and also mitochondrial Okay, if I understand right, uh, Pawan, if you can just go through the uh, chart with me. Child had lactic acidemia, then hypoglycemia. Um, were these the di possible differentials? Uh, this is from a clinical textbook that I've taken. So, uh, biotinase, pyruvate carboxylase, uh, fructose 1 6 resource, diphosphate deficiencies. Would that clinically fit uh, the presentation yeah. of our case? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. It clinically fits, sir. Okay. So these are the initial imaging images we have over here, and uh, the bilateral dorsal striatum or edematous uh, demonstrating cell toxic edema and uh, changes on the diffusion ADC sequences. No hemorrhage or mineralization. Um, uh, no structural malformations. The volume is pretty well preserved in the supra and infratenal vein. Spectroscopy could not appreciate a significant lactate over there, a tiny lactate, but given the, the changes on the MRI, the diffusion for a mitochondrial or a deeper lactate, we could have been expected. But other than that, I cannot appreciate any other uh, diagnostic peaks on the spectroscopy. Um, and to give, based on the imaging alone, the dorsal striatal abnormalities of the inherited uh, variants are mitochondrial disorders, organic acidurias, propionic acidemia, proteric acidurias, but the child doesn't have, I think, a microcephalic head. Uh, thymine transporters can have a dorsal striatal involvement with additional involvement of the thalamus and the cortex. Uh, Megdel is another possibility, but you usually have this fatty involvement or sparing of the dorsal striatum. And these are the other differentials um, for the dorsal striatal abnormalities. So, mitochondrial, I mean, inherited disorder of mitochondrial and organic asturias were given as the possible differentials. Um, Pawan, if you want to update us with the findings. Yes, sir. Uh, Chale was started on uh, mitochondrial and uh, metabolic cocktail and uh, uh, was on multiple AEDs and even uh, had to start mirudolum infusion for refractory seizures. And uh, we, have, we were able to gradually wean and stop the uh, mirudolum infusion. And uh, um, at the, by the time of discharge, uh, Chale was on NG feeds, was tracking, and there was still no neck holding. And uh, um, there were paucity of movements in upper limbs and lower limbs. And uh, TMS and urine GCMS was sent, but uh, it was inconclusive. And uh, whole exam sequencing and uh, mitochondrial uh, genetic testing we have sent, and uh, it was showing. Uh, okay, you can yeah give the diagnosis after. This is three month follow up. Uh, interval reduction in the brain volume with uh, bilateral striatal atrophy or necrosis or there. Again, okay, no mineralization, no hemorrhage, no changes on the diffusion various sequences, and nothing uh, diagnostic on the spectroscopy. So if you had only seen that scan, these are the differentials, but yeah, we have got that in the uh, initial part. And yeah, um, on. Uh, genetic report was showing FBP1 uh, uh, homozygous uh, mutation or, and uh, I, with unknown uh, significance and also PAC7. Uh, homozygous mutation, uh, which is also un with uh, unknown significance. So FBP1, this is a case from FBP1 with similar imaging findings. And uh, if we go back to the initial chart, uh, FBP1 is uh, one of the possibilities of lactic acidemia with recurrent hypoglycemic and encephalopathic episodes. So uh, the question is, is that uh, is the VUS uh, now uh, diagnosed? possibility or not. Dr. Amesh, and yeah, you can take it further from there. Yeah, I think biochemical high lactate with the high NM gap metabolic acidosis, generally GCMS will show significant elevations of GSRI. 
we have uh, two previous cases who both had uh, genetically confirmed fructose 1 6 dispersed deficiency the imaging was normal they had multiple crises one of them died during the crisis but uh, at least one child two mris were normal so this was uh, quite odd this findings we have not seen earlier mm. and i only found this chemically it is very much consistent by chemically yeah in literature they have mentioned that the findings are non specific but yeah, this was the one of the cases which had uh, similar findings in the acute crisis so yeah. i miss that gcms showed glycerol high in the acute phase did it show some did not have did not have any specific elevations but other by chemical parameters other than this they were all consistent the other two children whom we have genetically confirmed they had high glycerol because uh, had just yeah. the patients had the same fructose so they become unwell in the uh, acutely and become so normal in between and they do have in the gcms uh, uh, significant elevation of glycerol to pick it up right uh, like not they they don't have non specific changes right because they Correct. in fact gcms is something you say i have sent it for something else and you pick this up on gcms gives you the diagnosis basically yeah gcm is generally quite suggestive so only doubt was because we have never seen uh, in at least three cases of fructose one six this was this mri findings whether it's consistent so this is reported as in the us we'll do the parental testing anyway yeah, so i will found that, this case will that help you will that help you parental testing they will be heterozygous right yeah but probably we we might do repeat uh, urine later when we will mm. keep in follow up mm. because parental testing might not help you here because they will have heterozygous mutation <laughs> because that won't change yeah. your status of the mm. correct uh the question of organomegaly yeah okay i think dr mishra answer yeah okay uh Dr. Vivek or Dr. Ramesh, if you can define BUS from Dr. Nansen. I think whenever that uh, specific mutation or variant is not reported in the literature to be pathogenic, the labs report it as VUS, variant of uncertain significance. If there is any uh, uh, phenotypic features which are matching, some of them are matching. So uh, through segregation, parental uh, family segregation and reverse phenotyping, we can conclude whether it is significant or uh, not. So, what what does it take to actually match the phenotype in a meeting like this, and then change that classification? <clears throat> there are two ways. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. yeah go on. Sorry. There are two ways by which one can change view. So there are four groups of uh, so pathogenic, likely pathogenic, VUS, and benign. These are the four sort of criteria. Uh, what they give in the reports. so pathogenic and likely pathogenic we know that's likely causing the problem because it's been reported before that mutation or in functional studies has been uh, detrimental so is that group so the vus that's the most confusing group so vus becomes pathogenic or likely pathogenic in if if uh, so it's not now but if in a years time somebody else reports it uh, similar profile and similar uh, mutation then it can become pathogenic but the best way is to do functional studies so if you in a mouse if you make the same change as in this patient's uh, the mutation is changed the same way and causes the problem then it is going to be pathogenic or likely pathogenic but the problem is functional studies are done by few labs so most of the time you are not able to get the answer and you just wait for few years for somebody else to report it and then it becomes likely pathogenic or pathogenic is that right ramesh that's how yeah that's right that's very nicely so sometimes in right the right. familial segregation also helps even if you don't uh, sometimes you don't need to wait for that long just testing right. the healthy family members sometimes can help okay so it will be useful to publish these then isn't it that's the reason i asked because um, you will not be able to match for the future unless people actually publish these 
Um, the catch-22 otherwise, if you're not sure and you still have the phenotype that matches, because sometimes the imaging is very strongly matching and can explain yeah. everything. Yeah, so the two ways. One is by publishing and uh, uh, the problem is the, good, the journals maybe don't publish single case reports where you give this. Uh, the other way is I think all these companies, when they get these viewers, they put it in their registry, the registry which is open to everybody else in the world. Uh, and that's how it stays viewers. But when somebody else gets it, then it becomes pathogenic and likely them. So they do get, they do enter it in a registry, even if you don't report it. Is that right, Ramesh? Is that how it gets? No, so I they always the is going towards genetics. Something lot of cases must be there. Mm. So uh, that's how they like make it better because they always enter. So this company would enter it in a database. And somebody else from somewhere else in the world, once he finds it and matches it, then changes the the, the criteria changes. Sorry. So I yeah, thought I'll just <laughs> yeah. Got it. Right. Thanks. Right. In want of time, we'll move to our next year. Pawan? This is my presentation with similar case, 15 month okay. old, previously healthy child, born to consanguineous parents, uh, one of the twins actually, uh, presented with acute uh, metabolic encephalopathy, uh, high anion gap metabolic acidosis, uh, hypoglycemia, high lactate, and had refractory status before the present was with uh, severe encephalopathy. So again, you're thinking in terms of the same factor 1, 6, uh, based on the presentation. Yeah, no, yeah, some form of metabolic. Metabolic yeah. disorder, yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's the MR. Um, diffuse uh, areas of cytotoxic injury involving the a deep subcortical particle regions of the brain with relative sparing of the central regions, um, the brain stem, both there and the cerebellum. But as you can see, there is extensive involvement of the deep subcortical and cortical regions of the bilateral cerebral spheres. The corresponding changes on the T286 sequences. Um, uh, so the dentate nuclei also slightly hyperintense, so the age of the child is around one and a half years, so slightly difficult to say if it's normal or abnormal. But the predominant changes are in the supertentor of brain parent um, Yeah, again, um, corpus callosum is relatively spared. The cerebellum, the vermis at least was relatively spared. Uh, and on spectroscopy, we had a large, uh, I mean, uh, uh, inverted lactate peak over there, but that can be due to, in any cases of uh, anaerobic metabolism, given the extensive site of the injury uh, of the brain uh, in our child. And yeah, there was slightly elevated choline peak, but the choline NA ratios were maintained, uh, not uh, elevated. So yeah, the only abnormality was the lactate peak over there. And on the imaging findings, um, though the age of presentation is slightly older, um, uh, multiple cofactor deficiency, or sulfur dioxide deficiency, keratosemia, urethral disorders, uh, can have the similar imaging findings um, as seen in our case, and obviously mitochondrial disorder is one to be excluded. Um, yeah, and that's on the imaging. So yeah, I'll open the case. If anyone has, yeah, this is a follow-up. Sorry, Dr. Uh, Amish, you want to just uh, briefly describe the findings? This metabolic screening was suggestive of uh, like uh, a fructose one six dysphosphatase deficiency. The glycerol was elevated significantly. And other <coughs> lactate metabolites were also elevated. So uh, this is the only child children with infantile presentations I could find of fructose one thing this what is not in the acute stage, I guess, uh, but they, they have uh, some areas of uh, atrophy um, as the child progresses with involvement of the subcortical cortical regions. So the acute presentation, I could not find any literature uh, on the imaging at least. So as Dr. Mankar says, so, maybe we, we need to publish the cases. So question is either uh, whether this is due to refractory status because his seizures, clinical seizures went on for more than one to two hours at referral hospital before he came to us. Can, can that explain or this much of edema? I think it's too much, at least uh, to my opinion, but yeah, I, it's open. The, 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 the question is whether seizures can explain this? Yes. Yeah. Status. Yeah, it, it can explain it, yes. 
whether you want to call it alert or AESD or whatever name, this is um, quite uh, what we would see with prolonged status. Yeah, extensive cytotoxic edema. Well, apparently they call it excitotoxic, right? But excitotoxic, yeah, excitotoxic. Yeah. So uh, uh, the other uh, children with this deficiency, generally they don't have much of neurological. We have a child with almost uh, eight, nine admissions. Uh, our MRI, two MRIs have been completely normal. She's going to regular school. And uh, probably it's all secondary to the prolonged uh, hypoglycemic, uh, the status of lepticus secondary to hypoglycemia. Yeah. yeah, another big child who comes with crisis, but within one, two days, he goes back. So in the case report that you shared, uh, uh, did that child also have the seizures, refractory seizures, this one? No, no, uh, the child is not seizures. There were two they children. Have. Uh, that, so there are two scans. Um, Okay. But I'll just, I'll just check again, but I don't remember seeing the factory people at least. Okay. So this index patient, we have not had done genetic testing. Uh, okay. So we'll yeah. okay. All right. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, next case, Kitty. Yes. Uh, so uh, this was a um, uh, term neonate who was born to third degree consanguineous couple and uh, had a uneventful antenatal uh, scans in antenatal period. Born of, uh, born, birth weight was 2.5 kg, but had a weak cry. Uh, there was no significant resuscitation required uh, and the child cried on stimulation. However, there was mild encephalopathy and respiratory distress noted at the referral hospital and that's why he was referred to a higher center. And after admission to the hospital, they on day one of life, there were some seizures noted, which were controlled on two antiepileptics. And the seizures repeated uh, till day four of life, day one till day four of life, controlled with two antiepileptics. Uh, never needed ventilation. But on examination, actually, I had seen this child only once. This was uh, somewhere else. And uh, this child on examination, I had seen on day five of life. And uh, there was on examination, there was significant microcephaly with head circumference of 31 centimeters, overlap of all the sutures, very small anterior fontanel, uh, hypotonic baby with a weak cry and um, there was also kind of posturing of the legs. I don't have the photograph, but the hips were in abducted position. And even if we were trying to flex it and uh, bring it to the flex, uh, adduction, it was going into abducted position only as if uh, some early contractures were developing. So it looked like a very long insult uh, because already um, some contractures were developing. The, there was significant overlap, microcephaly. So it looked like there was some antenatal insult by examination. We can look at the images. Okay, yeah. So slightly pixelated images, but these are taken from the videos. Uh, on top are the diffusion weighted sequences. Uh, no diffusion weight uh, restriction, but you can appreciate there is rarefied, rarefied white matter in the subcortical region of the brain, predominantly in the parietal regions, also involving the frontal meters of the frontal regions and the periensular white matter. Um, coming down, the white matter changes are more extensively or clearly demarcated on the T2-weighted sequences. Uh, again, it's predominant subcortical involvement. Um, there is, again, periensular involvement. The thalamus and the basal ganglia are atrophic. Thalamus are slightly dark uh, on the T2-weighted sequences. The, base, the brainstem on the cerebellum appears to be slightly hypoplastic on the axials. So the corresponding flare sequences, we have these um, the white matter changes are completely verified. Uh, Pilom is subcortical involvement again. Some fair hyperintensity is uh, in the thalami, the basal ganglia thalami again are atrophic. And there is some degree of hypoplasia of the brainstem and also possibly of the cerebellum. Uh, this reminded me of a companion case which we had um, previously, and we had similar changes, especially in the peninsular white matter uh, with areas of uh, white matter and uh, deep brain nuclei uh, atrophy. And this was a case of molybdenum cofactor deficiency, uh, which can have to be typical rarefied uh, subcortical changes, uh, also involving the thalamus and the basal ganglia. And so this was uh, the initial differential which was considered for this for the index child. And um, yeah, I will not go into the differences, but Keithi, if you have a follow-up. Yes. Uh, so 
Yes, after this input, we had done serum uric acid and homocysteine uh, for this child and both had come significantly low. Um, we had counseled the ch parents for genetic testing as this was a consanguineous couple. And, um, uh, but they were not very keen and they left LAM and unfortunately the child expired after two days. I have a question. Uh, molybdane cofactor patients are not microcephalic at birth, are they? With suture overriding? I think this is unlikely. It's more likely a prolonged antenatal kind of hypoxic ischemic uh, situation. Okay, but uh, the homocysteine and uric acid both were significantly low. I can tell the values, I guess. Just a minute. Because that was the only correlating thing. So for a lower limit of six, the homocysteine level was 4.1 micromole per liter. And uric acid for a lower limit of 3.5, it was 1.3. So this was, a, 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 though we couldn't do the urinary sulfocysteine levels, but uh, we have these serum markers, which is corroborating. Radiologically, can this be PDH complex deficiency? Yeah, it can be, but they usually have a global paradigm involvement, um, symmetrical global paradigm involvement too. Uh, the early internet ones at once. Also. Yeah, they, yeah, the early ones, and they usually have some uh, dysplastic ventricles or subapanalysis or pistolism abnormalities. But they're typically known to have, uh, I mean, at least the global cellulose was involved. The based, uh, based on yeah. the biochemistry, the working diagnosis is of a of a urea cycle disorder. Uh, no, uh, it would match a uh, molybdenum cofactor deficiency. Low serum Moka, uric acid, right? Yeah. Low serum okay. uric acid and low homocysteine would match a molybdenum cofactor deficiency. Okay. Okay. Gita? Yes, this was a nine-month-old uh, male child who had a prior normal development, healthy, pre-morbid, and also immunized uh, with fever for only five days and uh, had respiratory issues almost uh, from day two of illness and had encephalopathy. Uh, because of the respiratory issues, we had to ventilate the child also. And there were neurological issues started on day three. So seizures were there on day three and day eight of illness. It was multifocal clonic seizures. And this child, we have done MRI on day five illness. So, and also presently, like uh, he's. Uh, yeah, good. Yeah, good, good. Presently, he is almost into day nine of the illness. Uh, he's still uh, requiring the oxygen support, and uh, seizures are there, and uh, occasional dystonic posturing is there. Okay. So, day five MRI uh, reveals uh, multifocal, uh, some confirmed areas in the parietal regions on both sides over there. Uh, more of tiny, small focal areas involving the D5 metaperimental or metapermental subcortical region in the frontal lobe, also involving the basal ganglia on both sides. Uh, some have this radiating type of appearance. Uh, so I would think that these are uh, smaller ischemic changes secondary to the infection, uh, possible vasculitis. Um, we didn't give a contrast, uh, or um, if I'm not mistaken, but these are the non contrast plate sequences. And you can see the focal spaces are completely filled up with flare or the flare hyperintensities. I'm not sure if the child was uh, oxygenated up and under IV, which can also have the circle hyperintensities. But there are some subdural collections around the frontal uh, convexities over there, some areas in the superior temporal regions, some specific changes along the bilateral perisylvian regions um, on both sides. Yeah. And post contrast study at uh, the bottom panel, um, there is uh, areas of leptomagnetic enhancement and also enhancement along, along the brain stem. Um, with focal lesions also demonstrated in the basic the brain stem and the cerebellar white matter. Sorry, these are the post contrast again. Yeah, and post contrast, you have the vision enhancement and pacumen enhancement predominantly along the mid and posterior uh, aspects of the supratentorial brain. Uh, so, and subdural collections do not enhance. Uh, there's no subdural empyema, but there's obviously some areas of subdural collections over there. 
in the bilateral frontal regions. So secondary ischemic changes um, in the white and the gray matter structures uh, with leptomeningeal and pachymeningeal disease and some bilateral subdural collections on imaging secondary to infection. Um, I think the question was, the is the um, small vessel disease or the vasculitis uh, too early at the time of MRI? Yes, Septococcus, Septococcus is usually the most common one uh, described to have these uh, small vessel secondary infarct-like changes. This is a case of at day six of diagnosis. And in, in literature, they have mentioned that in the acute and subacute stages, um, vasculitis can present uh, in the brain. And these are the examples of pneumococcal meningitis, but these are more in the second and third week uh, than the first week. Uh, so I don't know if the timeline is uh, that particular or specific for a vascular disease, but I, as you can see in the example here, at day six, we have these infarcts in the brain. And also, do we uh, see the changes at the different stages? Sir? On this scan? Um, yes. Sir. Okay. Yeah, the brain stem and this, the posterior fossa changes do not show restricted diffusion, uh, whereas the rest of the ones uh, show restricted diffusion. So the question yes, was, if anyone... Yeah, if anyone has experience of these vasculitic changes in the in the first week of illness, yes, that's the question. And if anyone has, has experience, then probably comment upon that. Perhaps I missed the point. Was pneumococcal infection uh, proven? Yeah, it, yes, it, it's proven. It would fit very well altogether. Yeah, again, it was proven. The only question was, do you get vasculitic changes uh, within the first week of time? Yes, <laughs> it is possible. Yeah. Okay, Gita? Yes. Uh, yeah, so this is the follow-up labs and uh, CSF-PCR uh, demonstrated pneumococcus. All right, uh, Sahil. Yes, sir. So this child is a eight-year-old female. She's orphan. So recently she was adopted by the parents, like uh, nine months back. <clears throat> and she came with history of seizures since past uh, uh, eight months. Uh, past history, the family and the birth and developmental is not clearly known. But <clears throat> the type of seizures that she is getting are like right-sided focal seizures where there is uprolling of eyeballs followed by loosening of body. And there is a generalized tonic con uh, deviation of eye to the right side followed by uprolling of eyeballs, then loosening of body and generalized tonic. Like, so partial to GTCS type of seizures. So uh, initially the child was started on um, Levera, but uh, uh, it was poorly controlled. And also there is speech delay in this child when we uh, uh, inquired. Mild cognition is maintained. Uh, rest of all, there is no neuro deficit in this child. Um, so uh, we had done an MR as a part of workup, and his uh, her EEG also showed that uh, focality. So it was showing uh, uh, right temporal occipital spike wave discharges with poor background uh, asymmetry. Uh, so for that, we had done uh, an MRI. <clears throat> Got it. So MR. Um... There is a cerebral atrophy, uh, slightly asymmetrical. The left cerebral hemisphere demonstrates uh, more pronounced atrophic changes in comparison to the right. It is predominantly in the cortical subcortical regions. The deep gray nuclei thalami do not demonstrate any significant volume loss in, com in com comparison to the entire brain surface over there. So predominantly uh, left cerebral hemispheric uh, white matter hemispheric atrophic changes. Um, cerebellum is relatively spared. Brainstem also relatively spared. The basal ganglia, thalamus, relatively spread again over there. Uh, some hyperintensity is pervental hyperintensity, subtle hyperintensity, but not very significant. Um, the calvarium is not thickened on either side. There, it is proportionately similar on both sides. Diffusion rate sequences uh, could not appreciate any areas of abnormal diffusion. These do not these areas in the insula cortex and brainstem do not correspond to the ADC sequences. And on post contrast study, there is no leptomeningeal announcement. Um, especially on the left side, a more choroidal plexus enhancement to suggest the possibility of a surgical 
uh, clinically also the child did not have any facial abnormalities. So the question was uh, the atrophy, what can it be attributed to? So this was a paper published in 2018 and what they have tried to class, at least classify the severe hemiotrophy based on the clinical and radiological aspects. Non-progressive is the, the insults which are usually single insults, which can be ischemic, uh, usually post-traumatic or post-irradiation. Progressive are the more the neurocutaneous spectrum, surgery of birth, Romberg syndrome, Rasmussen encephalitis, vascular malformations, and seizure-related changes, especially the HIT spectrum can cause uh, unilateral cerebral atrophy. This is our index case, that's our case, and you can appreciate that there is predominant atrophy of the left hemisphere, the peripheral region part of the occipital temporal lobes, and uh, as per their algorithm, surgery of syndrome, there's no left hemisphere enhancement, no classification of mineralization, though that can be seen in the type 3 variant, but commonly one must expect the angiomatosis. Uh, Dag David of Mason syndrome, there was no calvarial it, uh, hypertrophy. The frontal of the sinuses were not um, proportionately, disproportionately enlarged. Uh, there was no changes of gliosis, significant gliosis because it's not arterial ischemic insult. Again, no calcification for surgery of syndrome, no angiomas, uh, no enhancement. Um, the deep gray nuclei, usually the caudate nucleus and the temporal lobes are usually atrophic in Rasmussen encephalitis, which was not seen in our case. And uh, there was no vascular imaging find, though, no vascular imaging, though the flow wise on the T2s and the flares did not demonstrate any changes of moi moi over there. These are examples of uh, cerebral hemiatrophy, Rasmussen encephalitis. Uh, these are typical examples. You can appreciate that the involvement of the ipsilateral deep brain nuclei, there are white matter changes, cladic changes over there. Uh, surgery of syndrome, as all of you know, would have pyral angiomatosis, typically. Um, epilepsy sequelae can have unilateral cerebral atrophic changes and no other abnormalities, uh, such as in the calvarial bones, calvarium, or in the sinuses, as demonstrated in Dyke-David or Mason syndrome. They usually have some areas of calvarial hypertrophy and frontal sinus um, hypernematization. So, thinking of uh, post sequelae of epilepsy as the uh, cause of the cerebral uh, hemiatrophy, whether there's an aut underlying autoimmune process, uh, I would probably think of a clinical uh, spectrum or clinical handle for that. And I'll open the case now for the panelists to comment upon. I'm not sure whether I have understood your last question. For me, this is a long-standing residual change, not progressive. Uh, and in this orphan child, we have no uh, reliable history. I'm a little bit surprised that you have a normal clinical uh, investigation. Is this child left-handed or right-handed? Do you happen to know? Sometimes the hemi-syndrome on the right side can be so minimal that mm -hmm. you only see a left-handed hand in this. You understand my point? Yes, sir. <clears throat> the child is right-handed, sir. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So the question was, uh, it was it was thought of uh, primary depression Rasmussen encephalitis, whether that fits. Um, actually, Sire tells me that clinically the child doesn't fit into a typical Rasmussen encephalitis. Yes, so, so and, and the other thing is the duration of the MRI. <clears throat> if we was to know if it is a progressive uh, uh, lesion, that what would be the ideal time to do after six months uh, from this? <clears throat> so this, is, this is almost in the chronic stage, so that will be another difficulty. The atrophy is so severe on the left. Yeah, again, you have very experience. I mean, the whole hemisphere is much too small. I mean, this yeah. is long standing. Yeah. You will unlikely have a progression within reasonable time. You, you would have to wait ages. And no previous MRI. Oh, no previous MRI. Yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, unfortunately, if you had a previous MRI, that would have been more helpful than a follow up MRI after this. Um, and the seizures are uh, they were since only past eight months. Sile is the question of uh, any speech deficit. No, sir. As such, speech deficit is not there. There was slight speech delay when we had okay. asked. Yeah. Okay. So and he and, and um, uh, yeah. HHH as Hina says, uh, occurs really early in like uh, two years of age. 
Yeah, unfortunately, we don't have the past history above seven years. We just mm. know till the past one year since the child was adopted by this uh, couple. So, okay. So we're thinking of post acquired either if it's a perinatal issue or uh, something related to seizures if it is left sided rather than Rasmussen encephalitis at this point. Mm. Okay, sir. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Yeah, last two set of cases uh, from Kriti. Yes. Um, so this one is an interesting case. He was a six years old boy who had presented with the literal hospital with inability to speak and excessive drooling of saliva with low grade of fevers. It was thought to be more of a uh, laryngeal cause for the inability to speak and they uh, went ahead with the um, bronchoscopy. And that showed uh, some inflammation of the larynx and uh, bronchus, and it was treated as uh, laryngitis, and the child was discharged. But after going home, he was observed that he is not able to walk. He is uh, not even able to make gestures. He is not communicating. And there is stiffening of the jaw. He's not opening the mouth, a lot of pulling of secretions. And um, there was uh, typically right lower limb posturing. He was keeping it in a flexed posture and couldn't extend it. It was at this time that he was referred to us. And on examination, he was found to be conscious, obeying commands. There was a lot of pulling of secretions, uh, jaw stiffness, and um, restriction of neck movements, completely flexion and extension of the neck was just not possible. And rigidity in the upper limbs and right lower limb flexion posturing. Along with that, there was systemic involvement also, some bradycardia, hypertension, some autonomic disturbances were also noticed. Is the question, uh, does it fit rabies by any chance? Yeah, there was no history. Uh, of okay. dog bite. Yes, we had thought of uh, rabies. We had thought of tetanus because okay. of the very uh, stiff jaw stiff. and the rigidity. Yeah, yeah uh, okay. that was our second differential. Uh, but there was no uh, history of dog bite. Got it. Okay. So here are the amazing findings. And um, there are again similar to what you've seen in a case from Dr. Vivek uh, changes in the bilateral basal ganglia. Uh, changes along the um, peninsula region, um, but yeah, predominant changes along the dorsal striatum, patchy areas, not symmetrical in nature, left more than right. Uh, insular peninsula regions, this, uh, the hypothalamic region again demonstrates hyperintense changes on the fair sequences, mild uh, restricted diffusion on the dorsal striatal abnormalities. And on the T2 weighted sequences, we can appreciate the cerebral atrophy. Uh, diffuse cerebral atrophy uh, and the bilateral involvement of the basal ganglia left more than right, you know, their cerebellum and brainstem are relatively spread at this point. Uh, Sagittal images, there's mild thinning of the corpus callosum in keeping with the generalized volume loss of the supracranial brain parenchyma. Uh, no, nothing on the FWS sequences to suggest hemorrhage or mineralization. Post contrast, there was no enhancement. Cervical cord um, and the uh, lumbar spine screening was done with contrast. So, so the cord does not demonstrate any focal lesions or abnormalities. Uh, nothing in the cervical and thoracic region on the post-contrast study. Um, on the post-contrast lumbar sacral spine, we do not have an axial sequence, but I can appreciate there is some degree of enhancement of the cord hyper and nerve roots. Uh, uh, was an NCS done by any chance or was it just paralysis? Or? No, uh, actually the reflexes were brisk and okay. there was increased tone. So okay. that's why we didn't think of a peripheral nervous system involved. Okay, okay. So the axis would have been better to confirm, but yeah, there's some degree of enhancement on at least on the side of frequencies. So we um, had done, yeah, CSF uh, for this child. So think the R differentials uh, after looking at the MRI were like something like infective versus inflammatory. Yeah. Um, so, uh, for infections, we had done CSF, it was a traumatic tap, but the corrected cell count was six and proteins were raised, but we couldn't interpret the protein, but sugar was normal uh, because traumatic tap can also give rise to high protein. So that was not reliable, but the cells were six and uh, CSF PCR was negative, including herpes. 
and uh, because of that laryngitis and uh, laryngeal inflammation what information we had we had sent a respiratory panel also which had showed uh, enterovirus positive para influenza positive um, but csf cultures were negative and uh, the child was given antivirals antibiotics and even we gave iv pulse steroid and uh, by day 3 of uh, steroid the child had started improving the next stiffness had slowly, slowly started improving and um, uh, we had also thought of giving ivig because we were not sure because it was a very slow improvement what he was showing but uh, the child came for follow up after 7 days now he is almost normal he is walking on his own his speech has come back he is able to swallow so it's a very good recovery uh, at 7 days Yeah, imaging wise difference which I listed uh, sort of infectious, para infectious, like all these. Uh, I have nothing else to add. So, if anyone wants to comment upon the uh, treatment response and the imaging findings, so uh, welcome to. Uh, would we call it as EDM? Uh, was my question, or uh, would it be how do we differentiate like demyelination versus infective? Difficult question, which is always a dilemma. Usually, the infection really have more of a more of vocal vocality um, and respiratory diffusion pattern with some degree of enhancement, especially if the blood brain barrier is breached. Um, Adams will be more focal, uh, more fluffy kind of uh, appearance, and if should it should fit critically into the Adam criteria, whether that fits it or not would be also helpful. Yeah, because uh, there was diffusion restriction in this one, so that's what I was thinking whether it's favoring more of infection. Yeah, it is usually more focal. The atoms are more focal, uh, more roundish kind of uh, lesions. Okay. Okay. Um, no, uh, I couldn't send more. Parents were not uh, willing for further workup. That's what the question of uh, how confident are we in giving steroids in viral encephalitis? The question of uh, is it does it fit for the progressive encephalitis with rigidity and myoclonus? That is the form by Dr. Anis. Mm, but the child has improved. Yeah, <laughs> child yeah. come back to normal, which would be odd for rabies. That would be odd for anti DR two three, I guess. Yes, yes. But, because I, okay. only i have just given steroids i have not given even ivig only steroids okay. anything to add dr lokesh or aidan uh, for this case mm -hmm. so the good thing is the child has recovered i mean improving at least clinically so that should be fine yeah yes. okay um yeah i don't think we have any further comments so thank you for okay yeah this should be our last case um, devangna can go ahead yes uh this is a 13 year old male child was diagnosed to have sle recently in december which uh, he had fever joint pain and rashes and for which he was evaluated and treated for sle with steroids and hydroxychloroquine so he uh, was discharged from the hospital after about one and a half months he presented to the hospital with fever uh, headache uh, fever and seizures uh, status epileptic was he presented with uh, he uh, he was admitted out in the outside hospital and for this uh, his uh, csf analysis was done which showed 40 cells proteins of 126 and sugars of 42 esr was 80 so and uh, mm. but for persistence of his uh, symptoms and for his seizures he was referred to our hospital when he had presented to our hospital uh, he was encephalopathic uh, had meningeal signs positive uh, so we had done a ct and uh, we did not do repeat uh, csf at that time yeah yeah so ct is pretty unremarkable at least uh, on the image which i have on it was a was a contrast also done for this time uh no so only plain ct okay okay so yeah so both panels are of plain non contrast ct uh, maybe some hypodensity over in the right peripheral region but over here again 
but it's difficult to differentiate a normal circulation pattern from that, at least on only one sequence or one slice. Uh, yeah, possibly right sided, uh, slightly hyperdensities in the uh, Perinsa region and yeah, over there, but other than that, I cannot appreciate any significant findings. Yeah, so after the CT? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, after the CT, uh, we treated him. Uh, after the CT, we had a differential diagnosis of it could be SLE vasculitis or because he had received long term steroids, it could be flaring up of CNS tuberculosis. So, uh, ATT was started. Uh, he was uh, treated with injection methylprednisolone for three days, tablet aspirin was added, and he was uh, discharged on oral steroids. Uh, then he, he followed up after one week with poor, headache was persistent and some meningeal signs. At that time, we repeated uh, CSF and MRI was also repeated. Uh, lumbar puncture showed no cells, proteins 48 and sugars of 62. CSF gene export was sent, which was negative, and CSF extended panel of for viral and bacterial and fungal uh, was also sent, CSF PCR, which was also negative. And this is the MRI brain, uh, which was done recently. Okay. So, yeah. Um, MRI, again, you have focal areas of restricted diffusion in the right basal ganglia over there, bilateral basal ganglia, actually, but the right uh, anterior basal ganglia is the more predominant lesion. Some areas in the genome of the corpus callosum, um, and some subtle hyperindensities in the left frontal white matter. Uh, the focal lesion has significant perilesion edema, extending up to the temporal region, superior temporal region, perinsa region. On the right side, basic frontal edematous changes, and possibly some thin subdural collections along the bilateral, uh, medial, and anterior temporal lobes on both sides over there. Um, yeah, and on the non-contrast T1, we have these hemorrhagic lesions, um, which were demonstrated earlier on the T2 and the diffusion rate sequences. The right basal ganglia lesion is the one is uh, standing out over there with uh, again hemorrhagic lining in the GRE sequences. Uh, again, hemorrhage uh, lining the peninsular uh, cortex or the insular cortex on the right side. No changes uh, typically seen on a vasculitic type appearance, no bleeding or narrowing, but this is a time of flight MRA and not around contrast MRA and vessel volume imaging wasn't done. Uh, contrast, I think, wasn't done for the scan, only a plain study. Uh, so even the diagnosis of SLE possibilities uh, can include uh, these hemorrhaging. Uh, contrast scan, scan was done. Contrast scan was done for this study, uh, MRA. Uh, at least the scan did not have contrast. I actually asked the Bagna about it. It was done at tenet only, I think. It was done. It was a ring enhancing lesion. Okay. Yeah, she mentioned ring enhancing, but I, I, I couldn't find the sequence. So I didn't ask her. But yeah, okay. Let's assume that they are ring enhancing lesions. Yeah. Uh, one Suppose in the uh, vessel ganglia, and uh, there was uh, some small satellite kind of lesion towards the uh, uh, Sylvian region, the Sylvian region. Yeah. Yeah, that I can record. Yeah, on the T ones, you can appreciate that. So. On contrast, you say that they are enhancing peripheral ring has been demonstrated in the basal ganglia and the lesions in the inflow cortex. Um, so the hemorrhagic foci ischemic lesions can be seen in uh, SLE itself. Um, uh, they can also present demyelinating lesions, ischemic lesions. Uh, the autoimmune mediated encephalitis can also be presented. Antiphospholipid syndrome can be a phenotype of the SLE. Uh, the other differentials for the scans were uh, given that there is uh, uh, ring enhancing lesion over there, possibility of toxoplasmosis. Fungal abscess can have uh, these hemorrhagic areas within it. Uh, tubercular and TB was slightly unusual given that the T2 hyper was not, uh, the T2 and the T1 findings were not corroborated with TB and the gene expert was negative. Septic emboli itself can cause uh, peripheral enhancement um, and can be seen in uh, SLE cases. So these are the differentials on the imaging, which uh, I can at least uh, appreciate on this scan. Done. And I'll open the case for the findings of the others comment upon the findings. So the Bangla that uh, uh, the viral fungal and bacterial culture was negative. Uh, yes, sir. PCR everything was negative. And no sepsis uh, or sepsis there or anything like no inflammatory sepsis. markers inflammatory markers were raised sir yeah okay esr was 80 crp was also high okay background of sle could have 
Yes. The background of FSLE would fit the hemorrhagic lesions. At least on the T1, they are hemorrhagic, um, predominantly hemorrhagic, actually. Uh, and also, they bloom on the SWI sequences. Uh, I have to check the contrast sequences because the T1 contrast, and then the plain T1 itself, it is hyper intense. Uh, so, the difference on the contrast T1 would actually depict the changes on the plain T1. So, uh, I'll just have to check the contrast uh, sequences of location. So, So it can be primary changes rate to SLE is what we're thinking of given that the PCRs are negative. Question of C3 levels. Um, so did we do a C3 level? Yes, uh, sir. C3, uh, yes, sir. C3, C4 levels were done. That were normal. Uh, I don't think you have. Dr. Lokesh, I'll just set the contrast sequences if it is really enhancing or not. Um, and I'll probably get back yeah. to you. Because yeah, uh, I, the, T, the T1 which you do on a plane and a contrast, if it is hyper intense or T1, it sometimes gives an appearance of enhancement uh, because the T1 itself is hyper intense, the non contrast T1. So I'll yeah, just uh, take that. Discussed actually, you are not. Yeah, yeah I think that's that. Time. Yeah. So. That was uh, we have only uh, to treat fungus, uh, toxoplasma, yeah, or fungus, serum. yeah, yeah. The only other possibility is a fungal, uh, I think. So, can we yeah. rule on PCRs? C1 PCRs can like uh, right cyclophosphamide, everything. For the primary CNS disease, uh, SLE. Mm. Uh, so that's why we want to have an opinion whether we started on antifungals as well, okay. whether to continue, how long, whether there are ways to differentiate between the two. Well, I think once I have a look at the contrast, I'll probably. Have a sure. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. I think that's the last case. Um, yes, before we concluding, um, uh, the Sweden group is uh, hosting uh, a short uh, periodic neuroimaging class on the Feb 14th in in wake of the uh, earthquake in Turkey and Syria. And the registrations um, are open and can donate via the char a charity to AHBAP. So the whoever registers has there's a minimum donation and this will be directly sent to the uh, earthquake relief fund uh, for Turkey and Syria. And um, I'd like to now invite Dr. Shaila if, if he wants to just uh, speak about the upcoming ISNR uh, session, which is clashing with our next Friday session. So we'll keep you posted on the uh, adjusted date for the next session. And if Dr. Shaila is there, he can probably stop us. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me to this forum. I enjoyed your session, but wonderful, amazing cases. So this is regarding the forthcoming 24th annual conference of Indian Society of Neuroradiology. It is going to be hosted at Pride Plaza Hotel. This hotel is located in a place called Aero City, which is a big complex with multiple options of hotels ranging from all the budget. And this Aero City is located right across the T3 International Terminal, almost five minutes drive from there. So there's are 24, 25th, and 26th. The meeting starts at 7.30 a.m. in the morning, and uh, we hope to finish by 6 p.m. Followed by on day one, there will be an oral function, and uh, afterwards, there will be a cultural program and leaders. Same uh, for 25th of February. Again, we start at 7 30, finish by 6 p.m., followed by some uh, business meetings, and there will be cultural program and dinners. 26th, we start again at 7 30, finish by 6 p.m. After which, there is a dinner on 26th at Ames uh, Swimming Pool, poolside. So I cordially invite you all to join us for this meeting and may, let's make this meeting a big success. We have a one and a half day specific session for pediatric neuroradiology, which will include almost 40 lectures and 
topmost uh, neuro radiologists are joining us uh, during this time. And I'm really thankful for Nihal, who has really worked very hard to bring up this program to this level. Besides, there are 32 international speakers who are going to be present on site, except two who not make it because of the visa issues or some other issues. And there will be two parallel sessions. Hall A will be dedicated entirely for the neuroimaging and Hall B entirely for the neurointerventions. So we have going to have a parallel sessions, imaging separate and intervention separate. And uh, let's hope that this uh, brings us together and uh, the academic uh, function is also of high standard and there will be a lot of CME credits also. So I'm hoping that this uh, Conference sets uh, another benchmark in the history of the Indian Society of Neuroradiology. And looking forward to all of you, and it's my pleasure to invite you to this meeting. So thanks, Nihal, over to the IT team. Thanks, Dr. Chalesh. Uh, hope to see you soon, and yeah, hope many of us can join us in New Delhi soon. All right, thanks, everyone. Uh, we'll keep you updated on our next session. Till then, um, thanks again for joining. Thank you very much. Till next time. Yeah. See you. See you. See you soon. Bye again.